Welcome to Mushroom Wonderland. Now, I wasn't able to completely kill my skin cancer. That's this bandage on my forehead. I had the surgery on Tuesday, but the oncologist, but, but the dermatologist thinks I've made progress with the mushrooms. I have become a true believer. I've been playing with medicinal mushrooms for 12 years, but until Paul Stamets succeeded with his mother uh, and Paul was my student for four years, and but he said, "Well, lung can't you can't do anything about lung cancer." But I had just used a lot more mushrooms, a lot more different species than just turkey tail, turkey tail, agaricon, lion's mane. But even then, when when the cancer was under control, she still she was completely consumed with yeast infection as a result of the cancer. And we'd gone to doctor after doctor and nobody could do anything to help her. And a friend in Canada who makes these mushroom creams that we applied to her chest and her back and her lymph nodes that helped kill the cancer suggested, well, give her some shiitake extract and that might help. Well, I didn't have any, so I went to the store and just bought some fresh shiitake. Took a half a pound of, uh, yeah, five ounces, actually, of fresh shiitake. Boiled it up in two quarts of water and had her drink it just to soothe her. I didn't expect anything from it. She immediately started to feel better. Within two weeks, the yeast infection that no none of the three doctors could clear up that she'd suffered from for six months was gone. <laughs> and now a lot of her pain issues that have crippled her for the last 10 years, and now her caretaker, are going way down. She's starting to walk and move around and have a life again. And it's all mushrooms. So it's not just the ones you go and find and eat. But remember, we wouldn't be here at all without mushrooms. <laughs> they had to come from the ocean and change and make plants possible and flowering plants possible and trees possible and the mycorrhizal relationships, the inner ties and Almost all really serious mycologists are really into wine because how do you make wine? You use fungi, <laughs> you use yeast. But that's also for your bread, your cheeses. Mushrooms are an incredible part of our life. I love every aspect of it. I got into it for the beauty. I don't really care how many good edibles I find, but I'm really happy when I do find them. I did get to go, I spent, what did we spend, 10 or 15 minutes hunting mushrooms today? Actually, it was a, it was a walk uh, along Disappearing Lake, and there shouldn't have been any mushrooms there, but this, the first mushroom I saw was a Chelsea Porus piperatus, sort of an orange-red gilled, very, I mean, orange-red sponge mushroom, a little bowly, that's always parasitic, parasitic on ammonitis. And sure enough, there was an ammonite and muscaria button growing very nearby. But as I was reaching for the button right next to it, there was this other thing that I thought was maybe a another muscaria button, but it was attached to a piece of wood. And I picked it off the wood and I cut it in half and I found a mushroom. I haven't even got a clue what genus it might be in. <laughs> and I've been hunting mushrooms since 1968 when somebody gave me a bag of morels in graduate school and I got addicted. <laughs> and yet, I don't think I've been in the woods once this year without finding one mushroom I've never seen before. So, 
when I wrote this book for you all, I actually wrote it for me, by the way, just for me, because I'm approaching 80 and having trouble keeping track of all these bloody mushrooms. <laughs> but I tied this book to a very important program called Mycomatch, which is a product of the Pacific Northwest Key Council. I'm not a founding member. I joined in the second year back in 1974, the Key Council, when a group of people, mostly members of the Puget Sound Mycological Society, including the founder, Ben Wu, who specialized in Rushla, and then Dan Stuntz, who was then the professor of mycology at the University of Washington, and Dixie Lee Ray, who had worked at the Pacific Science Center and later became governor of the state of Washington, the three of them founded PSMS. And they just founded PSMS a few years before when I suddenly got interested in mushrooms as a graduate student. And then Anna, Anna and I took this adult education class. But since then, we've been trying, but there was almost nothing to identify. We had the savory wild mushroom, which had maybe a hundred mushroom species in it. Nothing else, and there's all these things we were finding. So we started writing keys. So I've been writing keys, but actually mostly critiquing other people's keys for since 1974. And I had no intention of writing this book. Not, not at all. I sat down and was writing some stories about mushroom hunting in the Columbia Gorge, because I'd fell in love with this area. And I told Dr. Amirati, Dr. Stunts' replacement at the University of Washington, that I was writing. And he said, oh, we really need this field guide you're writing because you've discovered so many interesting mushrooms in the gorge. And I said, oh. <laughs> and I wrote this book Good job. that you Yay. have. And, and the goal in this book is I've seen so many people with our mushroom book they look at the pictures yeah. and they match the pictures until they think they see something that matches what they're holding. And I wanted to, a book that would guide you step by step from the mushroom you pick to the identification of what you have in your hand. But it's really important to know that this book covers 960 species and we have right now roughly 5,000 named species in the Pacific Northwest. I know of an additional roughly 15,000 that are known and need a name. And even at that, I still find something brand new almost every day I go out. So I tried to write a book that would give you an understanding of the fungal kingdom and how it operates and how you can understand it, but wouldn't give you the impression that you've necessarily come to the right answer. But what is in the book is all the very best edible mushrooms, all the most dangerous poisonous mushrooms, all the very best mushrooms for dyeing fabrics, and all the best mushrooms both for saving your life mentally, that is every philosophy that I had a picture of is in the book, because that was one of my research areas. I held a Schedule One drug license for 30 years. No, I'm sorry, it was 25 years, but from 1976, when Paul Stamets and Jeremy Bigwood and Jonathan Ott had shown up in my office, and we, I hadn't a clue that there was such a thing as hallucinogenic mushrooms, even though I grew up in the 60s, you know, and, but I was a scientist, you know, I didn't even, when I was a senior in college, I tried to get some marijuana to see what that was all about, and it took me another year before I even could find that, what that was, that's how old I am. And I had no idea that there was such a thing as LSD or psilocybin or psilocin, and they certainly weren't mentioned in any of my books. Well, they're all in this book, if they're in this area, with one exception, a new import. 
because people are constantly finding things, learning they can grow them, and some of those things are spreading around quite nicely. And I consider psilocybin to be the most important med medicinal drug ever for dealing with depression, alcohol abuse, stopping smoking, stopping beating your spouse, and treating one another with compassion. So, so that's all there. So I've tried to deal a little bit with every aspect, the best. And then, in addition, give you an example. So if you walk out in the woods and you find a mushroom that has a rusty brown spore print, how do you know it's rusty brown? Well, quite often on the stem, there'll be spores or underneath it. Or you can cut the stem off, put it on a piece of paper, let the spores drop and see the color. Always use white paper because it's the color against white that's measured when we talk about the color. So how many species of and Cortinarius, which is the Jesus that has the rusty ground spores? Eh, somewhere around 2,000. I've got more Cortinarius in my book than anyone else because I've named more Cortinarius uh, from this area than anyone ever has. But only 10% of the ones that I found have names yet. <laughs> a lot still do. It's a lot of work. It's very expensive. But I wanted to give people, so when you use the book, it'll lead you to all, if you, if you found a king bully, it's there, you know, a queen bully, a spring king, an Ammonite of Philoides that could kill you, it's there. Now, if you found some obscure anosophy, the book is designed to teach you how to know you found an anosophy. So the other thing I try to inspire in people is when you're going through the woods, I want people to say, oh, there's a rushla. Now, if we break it, it'll break and pop like a piece of chalk or like a crisp apple. It won't, it won't tear apart like a chicken breast, which is what a chanterelle would do. So all those little, I've woven all those little clues in. So what I encourage you to do in using my book is the first thing you do is you turn to page 17, 18, and 19. There's three pages, and all of the guild mushrooms, all the different kinds, are in the first row, and then there's and different kinds of mushrooms. So you go down until you find a picture in the book that looks like what you're holding, and then it'll direct you to a certain page in the book and a certain lead. And you go from there. And for the very first lead, I made it the guild mushrooms. That's the first thing you'll see in the key. But it's the last thing you find in the book. It's the whole last half of the book. But since that's the one you're going to try and identify most often, I didn't want people stumbling a long time till they got to a particular mushroom alphabetically. So you start with that picture key see what your mushroom looks like and that'll take you to a specific place when you get to that page there's usually a very short introductory paragraph for example for romerias it will tell you the color of young romerias is very critical for their identification they almost always look like cardboard in age all the different species but if you cut it through the middle from top to bottom and open it up and look at the texture is it gelatinous? Is it cartilaginous? Does, uh, you know, does it have a rusty colored stain at the base or not? So it tells you all the keys to look. And it'll tell you when you get to ammonita. What do you want to look at at an ammonita to tell what kind? Because the very best edible mushrooms in the world, in some people's opinion, are ammonitas. The dead, and 90% of all mushroom deaths worldwide are due to one particular ammonita, Ammonita phylloides, because it has spread worldwide as people have moved trees around. It was a European species. But then it got introduced to San Francisco and it got introduced on the, on the East Coast. But since it has spread south, 
in California and has reached as far north as Victoria and Vancouver, British Columbia, where it's now abundant. But if you're here, you'll never see it. But if you're in Portland, you need to know how to identify amylina phylloides. So that was going to be the first thing I did in my PowerPoint is work through the example how you would arrive that, you know. But the other thing to know is when you're picking the mushroom, if it's something you don't know, carefully use your knife to get the entire base of the mushroom and lift everything out and be careful not to use that stem as a handle. It's actually technically called a stipe and that's the term I use because a lot of critical features, if you're going to identify a mushroom, are what's on that stipe. What the base of the stipe looks like is very important. What the cap looks like, what, the under, what does it look like underneath the cap? And especially with gilled mushrooms, you want to cut them in half from top to bottom, through the middle, and lay it open. Because one of the questions you'll, ask, you'll be asked, are the gills free? Are they barely free or are they remote? If they're remote, the stem will break from the cap in a ball and socket fashion. So all that information is there to help you get the right answer. You will not believe how many people eat Ammonida pantheronoides thinking they have picked Agaricus augustus. Now there are a couple of subtle differences I might point out between the Ammonida pantheronoides and the Agaricus augustus. The Ammonida pantheronoides has a white spore print. The Agaricus has a chocolate brown spore print. The gills turn chocolate brown at maturity. So that's a subtle thing you might want to note about the mushroom. Next, the Ammonida phylloides is incredibly delicious. The, a lot of the Angaricus are really delicious too, but probably the even better, even more delicious is Ammonida ocreata, and it's only a little more deadly. <laughs> so, but you can taste it. Spit it out. In truth, you can actually swallow it and you get away with it. Because mushrooms are not nearly as dangerous as wild plants. There are certainly certain wild plants that if you pick them and handle them, and there's even some toads up at where some of you people will be foraying with you if you handle them, you're going to get sick just from touching. You can touch the mushrooms. You can taste any mushroom, just spit it out. But the taste is important for virtually all of them. So what I've tried to do is lay out how you get to a good identification. And if it's a distinctive mushroom that you're going to want to eat, it's for sure in the book. If it's a poisonous mushroom, this really poisonous versus just a stomach upset, it's in the book. And if it's a great trip, it's there too. <laughs> So, how are we doing for time? Well, we're, we're, we're ready to break into groups. Okay, let's go.